Welcome to an episode of Keys to Currency where we interview high level entrepreneurs doing high level things. Today I got a very special guest. Um, this guy is all the way from the UK, yes, the United Kingdom, and he is a deal maker. He specializes in buying businesses. And so on this episode, we're going to learn some of these strategies. Um, this individual is, is a pioneer in this field, and I'm super excited to, to give you guys a glimpse and information about this. So without further ado, Mr. Carl Allen, how are you doing? Sir? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for having me. This is yeah. really exciting. It's a pleasure. So first thing I want to ask you is, who is Carl Allen? Who is Carl Allen? So Carl Allen's 52. Uh, he's originally from the UK. He's got uh, five children and one, uh, one grandchild. And I do, um, I do two things. So I, I own a private equity company. So I buy, grow, and sell businesses for myself and a whole bunch of investors that I partner with. And then I have the absolute privilege of coaching more than 11,000 entrepreneurs and business owners all over the world in 13 different countries, how to find, negotiate, and buy businesses uh, without necessarily using any of their own money. Awesome. So, you know, this is something, I'm a real estate investor, right? Yep. And this is something that I haven't heard about until last year when I met, you know, Mr. Abraham. Yep. Um, not a lot of people, when you think about acquiring businesses, usually you think about like how a T-Mobile bought out Sprint, right? Yeah. You don't think of um, the average individual buying out a mom and pop shop. Yeah. Just a lot of people are just yep. not aware of it. Yeah. So to the individual that thinks, hey, you know, I got to have a lot of money yep. to get into this, what would you say to that person? Yeah. So I, I learned how to do this as, as a Wall Street guy. So I, I spent, um, gosh, 15, 16 years doing M&A, really in the corporate world, so mergers and acquisitions with investment banks and large technology businesses and all those different things. And what kind of dawned on me during that process is how little of the company's own money actually gets used to do deals. There's investors mm -hmm. and there's trillions of dollars of financing out there that you can use when you want to buy a business. A bit like when you want to buy a real estate. You know, If you're mm -hmm. looking at a piece of real estate that's worth a million bucks, you don't have to rock up personally with a million dollar check. You can syndicate that deal with other partners, you can borrow money if the thing's gonna cash flow, and businesses behave in the exact same way. What's really interesting is when I came out of the Wall Street world about 15, 16 years ago to do this really kind of on Main Street, so I specialize in like, you know, one to $10 million uh, businesses that are generating revenues in, in most industries. So you have a, a certain price range that you target. Yeah. So I'm looking for businesses that do between one and ten million dollars in revenues and a cash flow in, um, you know, at least a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars per year. Because if a business is cash flowing, um, somebody will lend you money to allow you to buy it. But what's really interesting about the small business industry is what motivates a lot of people to sell uh, isn't necessarily financially motivated. So a lot of business owners that decide that they're trying to sell, they're just looking for a safe pair of hands. Mm -hmm. So if you build a relationship with that person, build a lot of rapport and really position yourself as a safe pair of hands, somebody that can kind of take their business on to the next level and they trust you and they know you and they like you, you can get super creative in terms of the financing. So for a start, when you're buying a company, uh, you never need to put all of the money down at closing. So let's say you find mm -hmm. a business and the seller wants a million dollars for it, um, the first thing you'll do is you'll, you'll agree, well, how much of the money am I paying at closing? I've bought businesses where uh, I'm not putting anything at closing. I'm buying the business like you would lease a car. So I'm paying for it on a monthly basis, and I'm using the cash flow that the business produces to, uh, you know, to pay the seller, and then I'm pocketing uh, the rest. Some deals you need to put some money in, but then again, doesn't have to be your own money. You can go and partner with other investors that will buy into the deal with you, and then you can borrow money from a bank, providing the company's got cash flow uh, and it, it can repay that money, a bank's gonna wanna put money into that deal. Awesome, so in regards to buying business, you, how long have you been doing this now? 31 years. 31 years. So 1992, I left university, went to a Wall Street bank. I left the Wall Street world 2008. So about half my career was doing the corporate stuff, the billion dollar deals, which mm -hmm. are really more about math and financial engineering. And then the second half of my career, I've been doing it more on Main Street, the one to $10 million deals, where it's a lot more about seller psychology 
mm -hmm. relationships uh, than it is about purely the numbers. The numbers are still important, but not as important. Okay, can you take us back and tell us about your first business deal, your first business purchase? Yeah, so this really interesting story actually. So as an individual, um, I so I was working, worked on Wall Street, and then I left Wall Street and I went to work for HP, the computer company. So I was one of their M and A guys, flying all over the world, buying businesses for them. You know, what, what is an M and A guy? Uh, mergers yeah. and acquisitions. Okay. So I was part of an internal team at Hewlett Packard, where Hewlett Packard wants to grow its business, doesn't have time to do it on its own. So we'll go and buy that growth, buy those customers, okay. buy those products and services, and, and use its considerable financial resources to do that. So I'm flying all over the world and I'm doing these deals. And it was the 1st of February, 2008. And my, my life changed like in, in a heartbeat. So I'm in this boardroom in Moscow, in Russia, trying to buy this business, right? And um, my phone's ringing. Like my wife's 36 weeks pregnant at the time with, with my son, Josh. And, She's ringing me and ringing me. I'm like, wow, you know, I'm trying to close this deal, you know. I got like freaking Russian mafia trying to like negotiate <laughs> this deal with me. She said, well, I don't care what you're doing. You've got to get your butt on a plane right now because like this baby's coming out. Like mm -hmm. he's four weeks early, he's coming out. So I literally, I ran out of the hotel room and I had, you know, my phone, my wallet, my passport, my luggage, my computer are probably still there. I've never been back. I managed to, I stole, I borrowed my CEO's plane, managed to get back to the UK, like four hour flight, saw my son being born. And then I thought, well, I'm going to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be with my family. So I retired and I was 37. Uh, and about three weeks in, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. This time it's driving me nuts. I got to, got to get my brain back active again. So I decided to become a business broker and I found a business to sell. It was a transportation business, a trucking business in England, uh, quite a decent sized business. And, you know, went out, found a buyer, and we were a day away from doing the deal, closing the deal. And brokers, you get paid like on a success fee basis, like a real estate agent. Mm. So I was, you know, 24 hours away from a couple of hundred thousand dollars in commissions. Wow. And um, Thursday night, the phone rang. It was the seller. He's like, dude, we're pulling this deal. Like, we can't sell this business anymore. I'm like, no, like, six months we're working on this deal. He said, well, come down and we'll tell you, tell you about it. So I piled down to the, uh, to the office. And I remember the rain's lashing down and... I goes to the business and uh, all the employees are in the business. And uh, I said, like, what's up? He said, well, we just found out the guys that are buying us, the pen has a lot of money, about four million pounds. Um, they're going to literally shut the business down. They just want the customer base. They just want the trucks. They're going to fire all the employees, like liquidate the oh, business. Wow. And, you know, we don't want that. You know, we and they said some things to me like, hey, you know, we care about our legacy. We care about the culture of our business. We really care about our employees. We want to make sure the buyer is going to protect the you know the the business and the employees and they said you know we don't really care who buys it and what they pay as long as they treat it with respect mm -hmm. and i don't know what came over me but I, I i just looked them in the eye and said well you know i'll buy it i'll buy it you know i can raise the capital um i reckon i can get you about half that money through the financing and you know maybe i got to pay you some of that over time and uh, and i did that deal so that was my first ever acquisition um so i transitioned from being a broker to thinking well if I can find a bunch of sellers that are more legacy driven and care more about their employees than they do about the money, um, then I can do a lot more deals and that's what I've done. So over the past 15 years, I've acquired 75 different companies, still own 17 of them today. And I very rarely go into deals now on my own. I'll always partner with people because mm -hmm. I'm that busy. You know, I want other people that can kind of handle a lot of these different things. So I'll partner and syndicate. Um, and then for the last five years, I've been coaching people. So I've coached over 11,000 entrepreneurs and business owners, you know, how to do this, yeah. uh, which is amazing. And that's, uh, you know, I'm very much mission over money these days. Uh, I love kind of helping people and, um, you know, letting people be successful. But that was my first deal as a transport company. I owned it for uh, just under three years and then, uh, then I sold it. So it was a oh, great wow. deal. So what is like the average hold time? When you go to acquire a business, like what's the average hold time you hold a business? Yeah, so I'm generally looking on around a three-year term. Okay. Um, sometimes it's shorter. You know, I get in, I can add a lot of value to a business very, very quickly. You can double the value and the market will notice and someone will come in and say, hey, you know, I want to buy you. Um, so it's a quick profit, so I'll do that. Um, one of my businesses in Australia I've owned for eight years. Um, 
and yeah, it would take a crazy offer for me to sell it. It's a really great business. I love it a lot. Uh, my son helps me who lives down there. You know, I, I wouldn't want to sell that. Uh, my biggest project that I'm working on right now is I'm doing a, a billion dollar roll up of e-com businesses. Billion dollars. Yeah, the health and wow. fitness space. You know, I've raised a ton of capital and, um, you know, we're off now acquiring those businesses. Uh, that's a five to 10 year project. Wow. Um, to create that level of scale and value, I'm going to be buying those businesses for up to 10 years. So some of my projects are very long term. Uh, that'll take me into my early 60s. Some of my projects, you know, are a lot more short term. I, I've done deals where I bought the business and then I sold it the following week uh, mm. because I found a buyer for that company that, um, you know, could scale it a lot faster than I could because mm. they're, you know, a lot more knowledgeable about the space. So. so it's very similar to real estate then, yeah. to where you can actually find you can an flip. existing cash flowing business. Yeah. You can, in real estate you fix and flip, but a business you can just literally find yeah. what holes that they're missing in their business, even yeah. though it's, it's positive cash flow, yeah. and turn around and flip that. Yeah, it's amazing actually. Like often, and what I'm looking at businesses, and I'm doing the initial kind of vetting and analysis, and it's really quick and easy to do it. You know, I can very quickly see low-hanging fruit, things that I can fix like mm -hmm. so quickly. Like a lot of the times, you know, their expenses are bloated. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that they don't do that they should. A lot of small businesses I look at do no marketing at all. Mm. They just don't. You know, they don't have forecasts. They don't, you know, they don't run ads. They don't do any of that stuff. They just rely on repeat customers. And those are really good deals because, you know, it's got a rock-solid customer base. Yeah. They're more raving fans than customers, but then you plug some marketing strategies into that business and you grow it over and above that solid base and you start to get some traction, you can forward project that and then price at a higher valuation. You know, if you, oh, you build a sales and marketing system and then you can take that business to a competitor and say, look, I've built the foundations for you just to add cash and stir. Like off you go and then you can sell that for a premium valuation, which means you can profit on that deal you know, very, very quickly. Awesome. It's, it's like buying a piece of real estate, you know, spending three months like renovating it and then selling it for one and a half times what you paid for it. Right. Uh, it's the same, same thing, really. Okay. So it sounds like it's very similar when going and finding these businesses. Like yeah. With, with real estate, we're looking for, you know, distressed sellers. Yeah. Um, or maybe those mom and pop owners that have rentals, but they're ready to retire. They don't want to yeah. deal with tennis no more. Yeah. So when it comes to finding, you know, cash flowing businesses, yeah. what are we looking for? Like, what's the typical, like, avatar of a business owner that's looking to sell their business? Yeah. So, so really, you're looking for, um, you need businesses that are cash flowing. Like, you, you can do distressed deals that you can buy a business for a dollar because it's losing money or it's mm -hmm. in some trouble. Um, you know, I don't do any of that stuff. Because you know, it's great, hey, I bought a business for a dollar, it was cheaper than a cup of coffee, but then your sleeves up, you're in the business, you're, you're buying someone's job, you're buying someone's headaches. I don't do any of that stuff. So for me, I won't buy a business unless it's cash flow at least $100,000 a year. Then you don't need to worry about it. You, know, you can put a manager in place, sort of run it for you, even give them a bit of the equity. But what you'll find is that there are, there are, kind of, there are two types of sellers that I'm really looking for. So one is baby boomers. So even though I'm a Brit, most of my deals that I'm doing are in the States. Because in America, 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every single day, every day. And about a third of them own small businesses. And they don't have an exit strategy. And only one in 11 businesses that try and sell in the US, small businesses actually do sell. So there's a huge market of business owners that, you know, they don't have any offers. You know, I can come in and get really creative on those deals. So I'm looking for somebody that's got a really strong motivation to sell the business. It could be retirement. It could be sickness, it could be boredom, it could be frustration, it could be that they've run out of ideas, um, it could be that you know they've taken the business to a certain level and just don't have the energy to kind mm. of take it even further and they want to go off and they want to do, they want to do something else. You find that a lot in the e-com space. A lot of e-com business owners, like on Amazon or on Shopify, you know, they'll get the business to a million dollars a year in revenue, which is the hardest thing to do. And then they run out of steam. It's like, well, you know, I can take this to 10, but I don't want to. I'd rather sell it and let somebody else do it. So, uh, so those are the kind of common reasons that, I, that I'm looking for. Um, I'm typically looking at, you know, sellers at least 40, 45 years of age generally. Okay. Because um, they'll care a lot more about the business than the employees. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'm looking for deals in uh, not every sector. You know, I love e-com, I love home services, I love engineering and manufacturing, I love IT type businesses, anything professional services like um, PR and marketing and, you know, all those types of deals. Okay, so for someone that's just getting into this, yeah. would you recommend that they kind of step out of their, their field of expertise and just kind of look for anything that's cash flow? Or no. Like, should they choose a niche? Yeah. Yeah, because the most important skill to learn in, in deal making is the ability to build rapport with somebody, build relationships. You know, so it's a lot easier to do that if you can have a sensible conversation with an owner about their industry. Mm-hmm. So if you know if you're a if you're a technology guy, you work for, let's say you work for IBM in the in the sales department, and you want to go and and do a deal, um, it'll be very very easy for you to go and buy a technology company. It'll be very very tough for you to go and buy say a vineyard, because even though you might love wine, I know I do, um, for you to build a relationship with a seller of a business and Bear in mind, if you want to buy a business where you don't want to use any of your own money, you want to partner with other financiers and you want the seller to carry a big part of that deal, they've got to know, like, and trust you. They've got to see you as a credible source to buy that company. If you have no experience in that industry at all, it's going to be really, really difficult. Um, So if you want to do a deal in an industry that you're passionate about but you know nothing about it, just go partner with somebody. You know, there are loads and loads of people out there that are looking for partners. So go partner with somebody. But my best advice is just stay in your lane. You know, okay. whatever you know, whatever you're good at, do deals in that in that space. Okay. And then once you've done a bunch of deals, once you've done five or so deals, you can become a bit more industry agnostic. So like I buy, you know, my, my career is in the technology industry. Uh, but my first deal was a transport company. But I'd spent six months building rapport with the seller and knew everything about the business because I was trying to sell it. So I was able to kind of do that deal. But that's kind of an outlier. Uh, generally, where my students get really high levels of success is just stay in the lane. Mm, got you. So when it comes to this whole like mindset thing, right? Like I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that people feel like if I'm going to go acquire a business, I need to know A to Z about the business. I need to know A to Z on how to run that business. Yeah. So if I go buy, no, you don't. let's see a $5 million business. Yeah. But I know about it, but I don't know how to do every single step yeah. in the business. Yeah. What do you say to those people that yeah. have that, that great, mind frame? Great question. So you, you need to know about the business and the industry, obviously, to build a relationship. And you, know, you need to be able to add some value to the business. But the mindset shift is you've got to think of yourself as an owner investor. Mm-hmm. right? You've got to think of yourself as one of those guys, not an owner operator. Um, operators are 10 a penny. You, know, you can go and find somebody to run that business for you that knows all that detail, all that granularity. You know, I own, or I'm partnered in 17 different companies. I don't work in any of them. And a lot of them, you know, I don't really know a lot about the intricate details of what goes on, but I've got people in those businesses that, that do. So when I buy a business and, and I don't want to run it, which I don't, I'll go find a GM that I can plug in. And it's generally somebody that's in the business already that wants to step up and run it for me. And I'll give them a piece of the ownership. So then they become my partner. That's smart. And they'll, they'll drive the bus, if you will. They'll, they'll make sure everything's running properly. I'm more the kind of the GPS. You know, I'll set the direction strategically. We want to do this, we want to do that. Uh, they'll make it happen. They'll execute on that vision that, that I create. But I'm not on the bus at all. You know, I'm checking in on that business once a week via Zoom or whatever. I'm looking at... Uh, the kind of key numbers on a weekly basis. Are we hitting the mark? So I can remote manage a business without ever having to go in it. You know, I bought a business in Alabama, two hours away from where we are today in Atlanta, um, about three months ago. I've never been in it. Uh, I'm actually going to visit my new business on Monday um, nice. after this event that we're at. So, uh, but I have a GM and a team in that business that are killing it. Like we've doubled the size of that business in. Were they already working in the business, or did you um, find some of, them? Some of them were. Okay. But then I put my own person in that's just kind of overseeing everything, and uh, he has a chunk of the equity. So uh, and he's breaking down the walls because he's my partner. You know that's a different mindset shift. If you know when you're buying a business, if you're using other people's money, your equity is free because you're not right. paying for it. So you can be generous giving some of that equity away to somebody because then. You know they're they're going to help you. You know, be really successful in that deal. Hmm. 
So if I find a business that I'm interested in purchasing and you know everything kind of checks out, like what's the average like net cash flow that you kind of want to like go after? Yeah. Um, when it comes to targeting a business. Like yeah. That? So so generally, the absolute minimum deal size for me is I don't I wouldn't look at a deal that's not cash flowing, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year. Generally, more like two fifty. So my ideal buy box is I want to see $250,000 a year in free cash flow. Because then, depending on how I structure the deal, I'm probably going to be using half of that cash flow um, to service the deal, to service the money I'm using to buy it, right? Whether it's external financing from a bank or the seller's going to finance it for me, whatever. So I want at least six figures a year in net free cash flow that I can divvy up with my, with my partners and my GM. So let's say I do a deal doing a quarter of a million dollars in free cash flow. Um, half of that goes to service the deal. So it's making about 125 you know, net after all taxes. Maybe 25 grand of that as a bonus will go to my GM. You know, and I'll take $100,000 you know, as the owner of the business. So really for me, to make, for it to be worth my while, I want to net in my jeans $100,000 a year from a deal. Awesome. Otherwise, I, I won't do it. Got you. It's just it's not worth your I, time. My buy box used to be smaller, but obviously, you know, I've done hundreds and hundreds of these. Uh, obviously, as you continue to do it, your uh, your criteria, um, you know, changes. So, okay. So red light, green light, right? Um, red light means it's a no go. It's a bad business to buy. Yeah. Green light means everything's kind of checked Jump out. Jump all over it. So, real quick, like, what are once you look at a business we're analyzing and doing our due diligence? Yeah. What are those red flags that you typically see in a business that's like, no way, stay away from it? Yeah, so one is valuation. Um, you know, what's very common in the United States is when you're looking at a deal, um, you know what the asking price is. And uh, typically a business is worth a multiple of its profitability, which is called SDE, seller discretionary earnings. Uh, and there's statistics all over the internet about this and the average selling price for a small business um, is between two and a half and four times SDE. Um, so if you're looking at a deal and it, the guy wants 10 times for it, I won't even look at it. Hmm. So my first red flag is, is it in that valuation range that I know a, a deal can be done? So that's the first thing. The second thing for me is, you know, I'm looking at the numbers. So I wanna see that, you know, are the numbers, are the books clean? Um, is everything like, you know, looking good, you know, the margin's good, is this thing growing? You know, is there any debt currently in the business? If so, like, how's that being handled? Uh, then I'll look at the business and think, well, does it have a growth opportunity? If I'm going to buy this thing, where I'm going to make most of my money is if I can double it and sell it. So I'm looking for a business that, that's that got some kind of growth. Most of them do because they don't know any marketing. So then I can go in and very quickly grow that business. And then I'm focusing on the seller. You know, I'm looking for a distressed seller of a good business. Hmm. So for me, before I even get into the numbers, before I even get into the market, before I even get into the growth opportunity, all I care about is what's going on with the seller? Uh, what's the seller's psychology? Why do, they, why do they want to sell? So the first question I ever ask a seller, once I've built rapport, first thing I'll say is, you know, why are you selling? Like, tell me. Tell me about the, the deal. You know, why are you looking to sell? This is a good business. Like, what's driving to sell this? And I drill and drill and drill on that because I want to know the real reason. Because when I know the real reason why they're selling, that helps me be really creative on the deal structure. Because sometimes a seller will say, yeah, I need to sell. My wife's sick. I need to take care of her. I need to do a deal in the next two weeks. Then I know he'll probably let me buy that business over 10 years. Just mm. pay him monthly. So I can do right. that deal super quickly. Um, if he's not that motivated to sell and he's looking for a good deal, I still might want to do it. But then I've got to go to the SBA. I've got to go and borrow money from a bank. And that could take a couple of months to kind of go through that process, go through the due diligence and all, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so motivation and urgency are things that I really want to drill into when I'm talking to a seller. Because once I know that, you know, the rest's pretty easy. Nice. So another mindset thing, right, is a lot of people, even myself a couple of years ago, I never looked at buying businesses. You know, when you think entrepreneurship, first thing you think is, I'm going to go start a business. Yeah. When it comes to starting uh -oh. a business versus buying one. Yeah. Why should I stay away from starting one yeah. versus buying one? So let me give you some market statistics, right? So 
96% of all small businesses fail inside of the first 10 years, right? Mm. That's according to the SBA, 96%. So only 4% survive on one in 25. Whereas if you look at the delinquency rate of people that buy businesses and use financing, um, it's only 2% only two fail. So if you buy a business, you've got a 98% chance of being successful. If you start a business, you've only got a 4% chance of being successful. And the reasons are obvious, right? So when you start a company, uh, you don't have any customers, you don't have any employees, you don't have any cash, you don't have any credit, you have no premises, equipment. Starting got, from ground zero. You got none of that stuff, right? You got a blank piece of paper. Um, like even if you've got an office or a building, and bearing in mind, you go talk to a landlord and he's probably gonna want a year's rent up front because you know credit, right? Mm -hmm. You got no track record, no credibility. So it's really hard to go and get customers. Whereas if you go and buy an existing business, it's got all of those things. It's got cash flow. Mm -hmm. You cash flow in from day one, right? If you start a business, you might not cash flow for two years. You buy a company that's already there, cash flow in from day one. You've got a team of employees, you've got customers, you've got products, you've got services, you've got reputation, you've got a brand, you've got equipment, you've got a building, you've got all that stuff. And if you want to innovate and do something really specific in a market, rather than start a business to do that, go and buy a business that's in the same field innovate from within because you'll have employees that can help you you cash flow in any way so you're paying yourself and then when you built whatever you're going to build you've got a customer base that's already there that's probably going to buy it so nice so it's got two more questions for you for the individual that's struggling um with the mindset and yeah. they're like you know i want to get out of my w2 or i want to create wealth for my family but this yeah. whole buying a business is scary right? yeah what would you say to that individual in order for them to take the, the proper steps so they yeah. can change their life financially? Yeah, cool. So I think I wouldn't advocate anybody jump out of a full-time gig to go and do anything like this, you know, whether it's invest in real estate or do deals or, or do whatever they're going to do. Um, you, there'll come a time, if, if, if you do the work, and we'll get out onto that in a minute, we'll get a time where you go out and you buy some businesses and they start cash flowing. Once that cash flow eclipses what you're doing in your W2, then that will be the time to transition and do it full time. So you can de-risk it in that way. And, and to buy a company, to buy a business, really, you only need to spend five to 10 hours a week. Um, mm. You can do it in your spare time. Uh, obviously, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll go out and you'll look for deals. Uh, you'll talk to sellers. You know, you'll talk to banks if you're gonna fund the deals and all that kind of stuff. You can do all that around all your other things. Um, then people say, well, yeah, you know, I have five to 10 hours a week. And it's like, really? Yeah. Like, open your screen time on your phone. You know, how many hours have you been on Facebook? How many hours have you been on Netflix? How many hours have you been, like, I've been on Instagram, all those different things. Add it all up. Like, we waste so much time as human beings. It, it's like crazy. Um, you know, so, you know, if you want something badly enough, and you have a strong enough reason, a strong enough why, you'll find the time. You know, if you burning desire to build wealth for your family and have a great future you know is that worth five to ten hours a week of your life of course it is mm. free up that time you know learn how to do this you know put the work in you know you can't just read books watch videos take courses got to get out there you got to do stuff you know you got to put feelers out to the market you got to find deals you got to meet sellers you got to make offers you know you've got to do all those different things it's like if you want to get fit and you want to build muscle you got to join a gym right okay yep. great but you got to go there three times a week you got to do the work you got to do the reps yep. and if you do the work you do the reps it's biologically impossible not to get fit right as long as you eat properly and be consistent same with doing deals you know yep. you go out there you originate deals you meet sellers you make offers you can't fail you just got to do the work gotcha so how can people get a hold of you if they're interested in buying businesses yeah so i got a lot of free resources i think that's a great kind of qualifier because some people might think yeah i want to do this and then when they realize yeah i've got to do some work no okay maybe i'll buy crypto or do something else but uh, i got a lot of free resources on my website it's dealmakerwealthsociety.com go click on that uh, give us your name and your email address we'll, we'll send you some free stuff some webinars and free training and free tools just so that you can put your toe in the water get onto the field of play and if it's like, yeah, you know, I really like this. This is something I can see myself doing. I've got some confidence. I've even found a deal. I need some help. Then we've got coaching and mentorships that can help people through that process. Uh, or if they think, you know what, this is all really interesting, but 
you know, it's not for me, and it's great. You know, they've maybe lost a couple of hours of their time exploring this, but, uh, you know, they're guaranteed to kind of learn something, so. Awesome, awesome. So you got different tiers and levels. Yeah. That people can get started yeah. with. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, um, that is it for today. I really appreciate you guys joining us. Hope you guys got a lot of value out of this. Um, if you could, please comment your favorite part about this video. And remember to like and subscribe, comments. Um, until then, I will see you guys on the next episode. See you guys.